Um, welcome, I'm Francisca, I'm today's host, and with me is Chris Jashir, uh, who's giving us a intro on the newest developments in the NF Core Cut and Run pipeline. And it's all to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, I will just share my screen. Is that all good? Yes. Can you, can, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, thanks for the introduction. My name's Chris Cheshire, and it's it's a it's a pleasure to be here. It's probably the first time that I've presented this pipeline uh, when it's consumed like a year and a half of my life on and off. So I'm I'm extra happy to be showing it to someone today. So that's good. Uh, the kind of run today, I'm going to go through the, the concept of the pipeline and the reason it was developed. Uh, I'm going to walk through some of the key features with you, uh, discuss some of the kind of more interesting points of the pipeline. It's not going to be exhaustive. Uh, and then I want to go through some of the new features for the version 2.0 release, which I'm going to shamelessly plug throughout this presentation. I want to go through some of the testing and automation features which I developed, and also, uh, of course, some of the future plans of the pipeline. So without further ado, uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm a, a postdoctoral research fellow at the Briscoe Lab, James Briscoe's lab at the Crick Institute, uh, which is in London. And my kind of focus is single cell multiomics. So I'm trying to develop a system or kind of rapid prototyping single cell system that will target ATAC, uh, multi-target cut and run or cut and tag and transcriptome all simultaneously from the same cell. And, but at the time when I first started this project, I knew nothing about kind of cut and run. And despite the fact that it's kind of an integral part of, of the pipeline, other than the, you know, the technique and the kind of results that it produces. So I thought the kind of easiest thing to do would be to find a project that uh, got me into cut and run uh, or cut and tag data analysis and this was it. So I realized that there was no NF core pipeline. I've been using NF core for a while for some other projects, and I realized that there was no NF core pipeline for, for this uh, experimental protocol. And that's where it went from there, really. Uh, and it just kind of snowboarded, but it's been a really interesting project to work on and, you know, still ongoing. So just a brief overview of cut and tag or cut and run. So the idea is that it's a, it's a successor to the, uh, ChIP-seq assay. Uh, and the main difference with, with ChIP-seq and, and these ones is that you get much lower background uh, kind of uh, binding and, and uh, non-specific cutting. So the, the basic protocol is that we wash antibodies over either a, a target transcription factor or histone mark. And then we attach an enzyme which has a protein A binding site that's been attached to it. And the protein A binds to the antibody and then the enzyme kind of just hangs around attached, uh, localized into this targeted area where the TF or the histone is marked. And then you uh, give uh, an ion, in the case of MNAs here, it's, it's calcium and that activates the enzyme and causes it to cut in open chromatin or on the nucleosome uh, around where this target was. And then you can get rid of everything and sequence the, the products. And then you get a very accurate position uh, down to the nucleosome level of where, where the uh, TF or the histone was. Now, the difference between cut and run and cut and tag is that cut and run uses MNAs as the enzyme that cuts and uh, cut and tag uses uh, transposase as the enzyme and you, you use magnesium instead of calcium as the activating ion. Uh, they have kind of, I won't go into it, but they have different kind of advantages. Uh, the, there is there's kind of some evidence to show that uh, cut and tag is better for transcription factors than cut and run, uh, but that's kind of all outside the scope of this presentation. The key thing to note about it is that the, the processing, the, the, the bioinformatic processing upstream is exactly the same for both protocols. So that's another reason why I wanted to kind of do this pipeline is because it kind of kills, kills two birds with one stone. You get two pipelines for the price of one. So I thought that was pretty cool. 
these approaches are really growing in popularity, especially in the CRIC, but I think globally as well. And yeah, as I said before, there was no NFL pipeline for this. So overview of the pipeline. Uh, this is a kind of uh, a diagram that's becoming popular now, kind of the tube map diagram. And we can see here uh, the, the general flow of the pipeline. I'm gonna go through this bit by bit, so I won't spend too much time on the slide. But in general, we have kind of uh, trimming and QC at the beginning. And then we have alignment in the middle here. And then we need to do some, uh, peak. we need to kind of gather up the reads into, into peaks and uh, uh, remove duplicates, filter, do things like that. And then at the end, we finally call the peaks and then we do a bunch of reporting going all along of the way. So the first bit I wanna talk about is the sample sheets. The reason I'm talking about the sample sheet, I wouldn't normally discuss this, but it's actually one of the new features in the pipeline. So I wanted to just touch on it. So this is the new version of the sample sheet. And uh, the sample sheet allows you to uh, basically define where your samples are and what the kind of structure of the experiment is going to be. If you know, this is very similar to all the other kind of NF4 pipelines around. It's kind of half standardized, I feel. Um, you can merge technical replicates or, or merge data from multiple lanes. And this is a feature of most NF4 pipelines. And you do that by having the same sample ID and the same replicate number. And then this, like in the top two rows here, and these two will then automatically be merged together as one sample, which is really useful when you need to get sequencing from multiple lanes and things like that, which happens a lot. The other main feature is that uh, we can assign control groups and control groups are really important in cut and run and cut and tag. You almost always have an IgG background control for those experiments. And so the ability to assign that uh, in various different ways is really important. So this pipeline can auto detect when there is a control being given. And uh, uh, that's detected by the fact that it's being used as a control in the final column here in one of the other samples. And the other thing to note is that controls are automatically assigned uh, as per their replicate. So we have the wild type here, which has one replica and then or two replicates, one and two here. And even though we don't explicitly assign replicates, one and two will be assigned to one and two here, which is quite useful. Uh, also, if we just applied, had one control group there, then the control, control group will be applied to both, which is also useful because sometimes you don't have multiple replicates of IgG. The other main feature of this is that it's got some robust error checking in it, which again is, is kind of a requirement and a feature for most NF4 pipelines. So I went over that because that's changed from the previous version and I'll just highlight that again later, but that's the sample sheet checking. The next stage of the pipeline is the, is the trimming and the initial quality control as well as the merging of the samples together. And this again is, is, is standard for a lot of bioinformatic genomics pipelines. You know, all sequencing machines, especially or, or Illumina sequencing machines require adapters and most people sequence on Illumina. And these need to be trimmed off, so this is, this is standard, and you need to do QC before and afterwards. But the reason I wanted to touch on it is because I wanted to touch on the, how the pipeline is designed and the design principles of it. So there are kind of many paths for downstream analysis, as we all know in genomics. Once you get to a kind of critical point, then the, the, the paths of analysis diverge once, you, you know, depending on your, the scientific questions that you want to answer. And, but the upstream analysis, uh, the point at which it diverges will always be the same. And so with this pipeline, instead of providing a load of features for downstream analysis that are difficult to test because they're kind of situation specific, I wanted to really focus on the upstream data quality. Uh, and for this pipeline, that, that kind of critical point is when the peaks are called. So I wanna produce really robust peaks that you can trust that is supported by a lot of quality control and transparency around how those peaks were calculated. And that was the kind of main aim of the pipeline. And because of this, this kind of enabled a proper development cycle for the pipeline uh, where we can uh, test and integrate new features, produce maintenance, analyze the kind of new features in, in kind of out in the world and then design new features and implement those in kind of a circle. Um, if we were having to test downstream analysis routes all the time and stuff like that, this, this cycle would break down. So 
going on to that, the, the principles that the, the pipeline was designed around was repeatability. So it needs to not fail. It, it needs to do the same over and over again. You need to be able to trust it. Um, it needs to be re reproducible, which is again, and these are kind of core principles of NF Core as well, but it needs to be reproducible. And this is what NF Core enables and next flow. We need, we can run this pipeline on clusters, laptops, doesn't matter. It should run the same as long as you have some key minimum in installation requirements. And the other two are the two that I was kind of talking about just now is it needs to be transparent. We need to know where the results came from and we need to get insight into those results. And the way that I've done that is through providing lots and lots and lots of reporting. So you can see here on the diagram, the little uh, stops that have a pie chart in. And these are all the points in the pipeline where reporting is produced. And this reporting is in the form of charts, tables, uh, and various other things, multi-QC reports, if you guys are familiar with that. And this really just allows someone to get a really good view on exactly what's going on at every stage in the pipeline. And if something is not clear, then that's you know, kind of a problem when we try to fix it as quickly as possible. So onwards to the kind of main function in the pipeline again then. So the next stage after this is alignment. I won't go too much in, into alignment. It's uh, using Bowtie 2 and its uh, standard um, alignment procedure. Um, there are some interesting parameters that we describe in the documentation as to how Bowtie 2 is run with the kind of reads that you get from this type of experiment, but that's kind of outside the scope of this presentation. After that, uh, we go on to filtering. So we filter out reads which have a, a minimum, need to have a minimum Q score. And also we remove duplicates from some of the reads, but not all of them. So one of the key things to note is that normally you would just remove duplicates, whatever, because you want to get rid of all the PCR duplicates. But the trouble is with cut and run is that you get this, because it's targeted, you get this very close stacking of reads over the same sites. And so even though, so th this, this is valid data, but um, some, depending on the parameters of the, the duplicates, um, you may find that this, uh, you know, gets filtered out when it shouldn't do. So we don't, we don't remove duplicates on the target samples unless there is clear evidence of PCR duplication that's too heavy to ignore. And then you can, of course, turn it on in the pipeline. So back, back to, so this is, this is all kind of standard stuff. This is something I really want to talk about is the read normalization. And this is something that we've changed in version 2.0. So one of the main stages of the pipeline is that the, the, the aligned reads are stacked up and uh, uh, then we get what's called a bed graph out of it, which basically shows you for each region, it shows you how many reads stacked on top of each other. And so you can imagine this kind of creates a histogram and this histogram is what's used when we call peaks in various peak callers in MAX2 or, or, or SIACA. And these peaks need to be normalized in some way. So there are quite a few different sources of uh, normalization kind of error uh, in, in these experiments. The first is experimental batch effects. You know, if you used different enzymes, different antibodies, um, you know, different batches of antibodies and things like that. They can produce different results and that's kind of outside the scope of the pipeline it's quite difficult to fix that once you get to the bioinformatics stage in this in this class of experiments so i'll move on from that um, and the other really kind of big thing that we need to account for is is epitope abundance so some some epitopes that you target such as some histone marks are really quite ubiquitous across the genome and some like, you know, some rarer transcription factors and things like that are much more targeted. And so you're going to get traditionally kind of less reads associated with with those lower abundance epitopes, yet they're just as important if you're trying to compare them. So one of the main tasks that we have to do is to normalize between them so that we don't get tiny, tiny little peaks or, or no peaks called for uh, this, this low abundance transcription factor when we actually do want to detect those sites. So the original way to do this uh, was using spiking normalization, and this is back from the kind of chip seek days. So the spiking is uh, has some E. coli DNA that's left over from the from the process of uh, producing the protein, uh, uh, the the enzyme either MNAs or, or uh, uh, transposase, and uh, this the amount of this. Uh, the amount of uh, the epitope and the amount of the spike in DNA that's present 
Um, and if you keep the amount of the enzyme constant, that decides how many reads, how many kind of cuts you get on the E. coli DNA versus how many cuts you get on your target genome. And you can kind of use this to normalize uh, against how much of the epitope was present. But there's some big problems with this. Number one is that the newer cut and run and cut and tag uh, uh, kits are, are processed so that you don't really have very much spike in at all in the, in the kits left over. It's all been kind of cleaned out. And so that was a big problem. We're starting to see that a lot in the pipeline. Uh, it, people coming to me talking about these projects is that they can't normalize properly against spiking because there isn't any. And some people have realized this and have started to spike in their own DNA, but that comes with its own problems with getting the correct amount spiked in and stuff. The other thing uh, that's required when you're looking at epitope abundance and normalizing with spiking is that the, uh, you need to have the same amount of material, the same amount of cells um, in the experiment in order for this normalization to work. And that's just not the case in a lot of experiments, especially with you know, tissue samples and things like that. You just can't guarantee that. And so again, we're seeing that this kind of normalization is really hard to achieve. So in the new version, version two, we've started to include options for normalizing against uh, read counts and read depths across the genome. And uh, using, um, uh, deep tools. And we found this to be quite successful so far. It's not as complex as, as normalizing against, uh, you know, spike in DNA. You're literally just normalizing against the read depth between different samples, which obviously, if you've got different abundances of epitopes, that's going to cause other problems. But it's better than no normalization. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's proving successful so far. There's quite a lot of manual tweaking involved. But I just wanted to highlight that these are the kind of main questions we're thinking about in this pipeline and this is not finished you know we're going to carry on trying to work out what the best way of getting the most robust trusty you know trustworthy peaks from from the pipeline uh, now i'm aware that i'm probably running out of time yes i am so i'm going to move a little bit quicker so the the final kind of major stage of the pipeline is that they would call peaks again i wanted to highlight this because we the old peak cooler um Siaka, which is produced by the Hennikoff lab who developed cut and run and cut and tag. Uh, some people were having uh, some, some issues with it or just wanted to use Max2, which is the kind of standard peak cooler for high background noise experiments like uh, ChipSeq uh, and ATAC-seq. Uh, and um, yeah, so we included Max2 as an extra peak cooler. And you can actually run both peak coolers in parallel together if you want in the pipeline to compare the results. So that's another major change. And the last kind of stage of the pipeline is, you know, to give us some really trusting peaks. You know, we've, we've tried to normalize as best we can. When we call the peaks, we, we call them uh, against the IgG background if it's provided. So that's another form of normalization. And then we also can do consensus peaks. So how many of these peaks are present in our replicates? Uh, and we can, we can be stringent if we want and say we need all the peaks present for uh, for this peak to be trusted. So as you can see, that's what we really concentrate on is, is trusted peaks and transparency for using the reporting. So key feature summary for version 2.0. Now this version is not out yet. It's gonna be out in the next few days, hopefully. I'm trying to find time to go through all the kind of final changes um, before it can get approved for release. But hopefully uh, next week, this will be released. Uh, the, sample system, the sample sheet system redesign, We've got additional read normalization options, which I've just been through. We've got additional peak cooler options, and we have loads of like bug fixes and performance optimizations and things like that. So another shameless plug of version 2.0, go ahead, go ahead and use it. And please do let me know if there's any kind of problems. Um, I think I might, I'll just touch on this very briefly because I'm aware I've got to finish. Uh, this is just a note on testing. Um, I basically took what the test do, this is kind of for the pipeline developers out here, but I took the testing that we do in NFCore modules with the YAML testing with PyTest, and I applied that to the pipeline. And we now have 213 tests that run using PyTest for every code change that we make on the pipeline. And I think it's really made the pipeline a lot more robust, especially because it's just me working on it, or just there's a couple of us just working on it. So I really think that was important. And please, if you have any questions, if you're developing pipelines, got any questions on it, come and contact me because I do think this is quite a good uh, advantage. Um, so finally, uh, news and, and the future. 
Uh, the version 2.9 release is imminent, as I've already said. Uh, we really need developers. It's just me and an, uh, another woman called Tamara working on it. And, you know, we really want to push these features forward, uh, but we need we need you guys in the community to, to suggest features and help with the coding if you possibly can. Uh, we are going to looking at more options for peak calling um, and also some very rigid downstream options such as nuclear zone positioning and transcription factor footprinting. We're, lo we're looking into it. We really want to get we don't want to get too far in the downstream, but these look like quite good options. And then finally, I just want to notice, of course, my project, my main project is single cell, and I really want to adapt this pipeline to to work with single cell data at some point. There's a lot of talk around that to be had, but I really would like to have. NFCore have a, a robust single cell cut and tag pipeline, because uh, I think that's the kind of future. So thanks for listening. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone at the Luscombe and the Briscoe Lab. I wanted to thank Charlotte West, who I think's on the call, because uh, she was the original kind of co-developer of this pipeline. She's, she's now left. And then also Tamara Hodgetts, who's the new kind of co-developer on this project. So thank, thanks everyone and thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Um, I have now enabled um, people to unmute themselves for a Q&A. Uh, you can of course also write in the chat and I will read out the questions. So are there any questions? I have one. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you've introduced these two new normalization um, options, normalizing its read counts or read depth. Do you have specific scenarios in mind as to which, what, when is better to use read counts? When is better to use read depths? Yeah. So not at the moment. So we, we basically uh, Deep Tools has some normalization options available to it that are kind of really based in the RNA seq world. So there's a bunch of like uh, transcription, it, uh, you know, normalization against, you know, killer base length of the transcripts and things like that, those kind of classical RNA normalization techniques. And we've taken some of those options and kind of introduced them just for set regions of the genome. So at the moment, basically we have a bin size of one on the genome and we calculate the, the read depth at that bin size of one and then normalize uh, against that in that region, um, against the the other samples, um, and then you can widen that bin um, if you wanted to to cover a larger amount of features. Uh, but it's really it's really just to kind of get them a little bit more in line with each other. And we're still waiting to see uh, how helpful those options are, kind of downstream. But really, the the other feature of it really was being able to turn the spike in normalization off as well. Yeah. So it, Cause it was on by default the whole time and you couldn't change that. So there was an additional option just to turn it off at all. And then the idea is that we provided these extra options and that people just um, start playing with them and come back to this, to us about how useful um, they are. For one case in point, um, a group that I'm working with at the Crick, we turned off spike in normalization and just did um, a bin of one read depth normalization. And then um, we basically that resulted in um, the, the samples looking a lot better, but the IgG kind of background was, was super high because the, uh, uh, the, the relative read depth on the IgG samples is, is low. You get less reads with the IgG because it's spread out more. Um, so what we did is we included an extra parameter in the pipeline to be able to scale the IgG background back uh, and then use it to call peaks. So we have a situation now where we have like uh, the, we can basically scale the IgG to, to change how many peaks are being called on the sample. So we, we're basically now in a situation where we have to run with an IgG threshold of like 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and one. And then we look at how many peaks have been called um, for each sample and basically tune it to the experimental question that we're looking at. So for example, you with transcription factors, you may want to look at something with a bit more minute kind of more peaks being called so you can pick up more binding. Um, whereas with histones, you might want to lower that threshold um, uh, oh, sorry, raise the threshold for, for peak calling so that less peaks are called. So it's, it's really kinda, interesting. 
Yeah, it's an active area of development. I, I would suggest what you do if you're going to turn it off is do the CPM mode normalization, which is what, what's recommended in the documentation, and then run it with an IgG background threshold of five different ones, 0.2, 0.4, 0.6, 0.8, 1, and see how it looks in the IgG browser or however you view your peaks. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Artemy. Artemy Golden. Yes. yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the QC. You've uh, stressed that you provide so many QC reports for the user to assess, but I'm coming from the uh, perspective of a person who never did uh, who never did prep processing for the peaks, and it's very hard to assess after you get the reports. Uh, like, is it good or not? Could you provide some kind of like a representative? Uh, series of different uh, QCs from different data since you are communicating with the users to just show that this is how um, a good quality would look like and this maybe have a bad quality. But it's really non-intuitive and I, I, I tried to find somewhere some documentation how it should look like or in the papers but people don't write about it. That's a, that's a really excellent question, uh, and yeah, it's a great idea. I shall absolutely do that. Um, I, I will, I'll, I'll create a new section of the documentation um, to show some kind of examples, for sure. That's a, that's a really good idea. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And then we have another uh, question from Harshil Patel. Oh, Chris, great talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so my question goes back to the normalization. Um, when you normalize um, in the way that you mentioned, um, uh, do you factor in global changes? So say, for example, you have a control group which um, uh, has a level of um, signal, and then you have a treatment group where you have systematic changes, so you have an uplift everywhere in that signal. Um, the normalization on the base pair level or, or per region would essentially be cancelled out in that scenario, in which case you wouldn't really see a signal, even though there could possibly be a change or something to be had there, right? Yeah, so you there are options to do global normalization as well. Um, but it, it because it's a bit experimental, you kind of have you do have to have an understanding exactly what you just said. You have to have that understanding and know which normalization options that you need because of that. Um, the, the pipeline doesn't do it for you uh, so yeah but there are global normalizations you can if you want to you can literally just uh normalize against um the total read count if you wanted to but, yeah uh, but even in that scenario i think it would cancel out so ironically the only way you could really do a proper global uh, or detect proper global changes is via spikings um yeah. even though they're unreliable for this type of experiment um, because it yep. gives you some sort of reference point as to how much things are changing across your sample groups. Yep, I couldn't agree more. I, I, would, I, I don't pretend to say that the, the, the recount normalization, there's a reason why people don't do recount normalization because it's, yeah, it's not particularly accurate. And I would agree with you that spiking is, is far better as a normalization option if it's an option. But we were just getting so many projects where there was, there was just like, you know, 10 reads or something. You yeah. know, there's just no no alignment whatsoever. There's no option uh, to do it. And also it was giving us some really screwy results, um, even if there were reads that were found. Um, so it's just, uh, you know, because it, it just relies on the fact that you've got to have the same cell counts. Um, I think that was mainly the problem that we're getting is just differing amounts of material. So it's okay. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. I'm always so, surprised uh, that it works for this type of experiment. For RNA seq, it's very different, but here where you have lots of background, you have variability in your antibodies, you have variability in cell count, you have variability in um, pull down. Um, yeah, I'm surprised that it even works, to be honest. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I I think it's you know for version the ne the next the next kind of version we really need i mean to be honest we really need to start a project on this that's a community based project and try and find you know people who are interested in cut and run and try and find a good way of normalizing this data and taking these factors into account because none of it's a magic bullet um and it's, it really affects the results you really have to run it with all different parameters and the amount of peaks that you get called is completely different depending on how you parameterize the normalization
Um, okay, if there are no other questions in the audience, then um, I want to close again by thanking Chris uh, for a great talk. And uh, I also would like to uh, thank the John Zuckerberg Foundation for um, giving us some funding. And um, for anyone who has further questions, maybe later on, you can always reach us at the uh, Slack channel for either Cut and Run or for Bite Size. And uh, thank you very much, everyone else. <laughs>